Today's a day I get tanked up. What's up everybody, if you've been following me for a while, welcome back, if not, hello. My name is Mike, I'm an internal medicine doctor, and I was recently diagnosed with COVID. Now the purpose of today's video, and all the other videos, is to make sure you know just exactly kind of what I'm going through when I'm going through it. I think the pinnacle of good medicine is open and honest communication between provider and patient, or provider and patient. So what I'm doing this week is making a new video every single day to talk about my COVID experience and the things that I've been going through with this disease after being vaccinated almost nine months ago and now going to get Regeneron or, and I have to, Casarivimab slash Imdevimab. Now I know what you might be thinking, it's kind of weird how they name these things. There is a formula, they don't do it to be mean to, well, all of us. Right, so there's four parts of it. There's a prefix, a substem, A, a substem, B, and it looks like a suffix. Now, each one of these things are named for either the protein it's going after, the protein it comes from, where it comes from. Does it come from a human? Does it come from a virus? Does it come from a rat? Does it come from whatever it comes from? I'm not gonna pretend to know how they came up with these particular ones because it's kind of beyond my scope. But what I do want to talk about is why I have decided so quickly to jump into this, and this requires a study from The Lancet that you and I are going to go over today. First of all, that's what it looks like. It's kind of a cool molecule that we can kind of put together. Now, the purpose of this split molecule, or I guess there's two of them, there's casirubimab and Imdevimab. I'm gonna get that wrong so many times. But there's two monoclonal antibodies in this particular cocktail. Now the purpose of this is, well, just one will go after one little part of that spike protein. If we have two of them going to two different parts of the spike protein, if that spike protein mutates one of its proteins, then the other one will be fine. That's how that's gonna work. So like I said, there's a study in The Lancet that I looked at a couple of times, and I kinda of wanna take you through the big points, why it's good, why it's not so good, and uh, why I'm gonna go do this. So first of all, this study was over the course of a couple months throughout the Mayo Clinic system. What they did to find patients was essentially just look at all the patients they've had, see how many of these people got this, and match the people who got the drug to people who didn't get the drug. Kind of age match and make sure they're the same, roughly the same people, just to make sure everything is as even as possible. Now, first problem with this, it's a retrospective cohort study. This is not nearly as good as a randomized control trial. I know what you're thinking, you'd love to have the RCTs, and so would I, but we kind of don't have time for that at the moment. So between December 2020 and April 2021, they examined almost 28,500 patients, and they ended up with 696 in the treatment group and 696 patients who did not. Now, they have something called a one-to-one -one propensity score matching. Essentially, they wanna make sure each of the patients in the group were as close to the same person as humanly possible. It's tough, but they're close. Now, I do want to mention this is for patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms. Once you go to the hospital, they did not study those patients. This is mild to moderate. Once you become hypoxemic or need hospitalization, you're out, you're severe COVID. Patients like me who had the sniffles for a couple of days and I feel pretty good today, yeah, I fit. I would characterize myself probably as mild. So let's go through some results and see what they found. The first outcome they looked at is hospitalization. How many of these patients with mild to moderate COVID actually ended up at the hospital 14 and 21 and 28 days after either getting the drug or time zero when they would have gotten the drug but didn't. So in the treatment group, the Regeneron group, the Casarimumab Imdevimab group, <laughs> I'm gonna get better as this video goes on, I promise. At 14, 21, and 28 days, the percentage of the population in that group that got hospitalized was 1.3, 1.3, and 1.6. In the control group, the patients that did not get the drug, the 14, 21, and 28 day hospitalizations were 3.3%, 4.2%, and 4.8%. The group that got the drug obviously did better, and it was statistically significant based on the 95% confidence intervals. So that's hospitalization, and that was the thing they were going for, but they were also looking at intensive care unit admission and mortality. So those showed a trend, but were not statistically significant. Here's what they showed. 14, 21, 28 days in the treatment group. 0 0.73, 0 0.73, 0 0.73 in the ICU. That's percent, 0.73%, so less than 1%. In the control group, 0 0.87, 0 0.87, and 1.0% of patients got admitted to the ICU. A little bit higher, you can kind of see where that's going, not statistically significant. So I call that a trend, looks like maybe. Now I'll get to why I think maybe later. Finally, mortality, again, 14 days, 21 days, and 28 days. So relatively close outside of either time zero or getting the drug. The treatment group, 14 days was 0.15%, 21 days, 0.15%, 28 days, 0.15%. 
the control group at 14 days, 0.44%, 21 days, 0.44%, and 28 days, 0.59%. Again, a trend, not statistically significant. Why am I saying these are a trends, and why am I saying maybe this is a thing? Well, this retrospective cohort study had 696 patients per group. For a big study, that's remarkably small. And big, I mean important. Very, very small study. So with more power or with more patients enrolled, we may have seen this, even if the numbers were the same, it may have been statistically significant because we're more confident that these two groups are indeed different. Now, one more thing I will say about this particular drug and why I'm specifically gonna go get it is they treated patients with at least one severe risk factor for COVID. You had to have at least one. Now, what are those risk factors? Age over 65, diabetes, BMI of greater than 35, being immunocompromised or being on an immunocompromising drug. Also acceptable patients of 55 years or older with high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, or some form of chronic lung disease. I have diabetes, I fit that category, I have a severe risk factor. Do I think I'm actually gonna do poorly with COVID based on who I am? No. I don't. However, I see these trends and I see the hospitalization rates are significantly lower in the patients with this drug, so I'm gonna go get it. So let's go get it. So here's my chair. I can't stress this enough how much I absolutely loathe getting IVs, getting my blood drawn, but I'm sure I'll talk about it later too. Of course, most of the way through this, there was a lot of questions. Questions about symptoms, most of the answers were no, and some of them were yes. But something that is never too cool to do is be nice. So whenever I could, I try to make people laugh around me. So that included the nurse taking my questions. And yeah, we like to have a good time, even though I'm, you know, sick and getting an experimental drug pumped into my veins. But, you know, we might as well be in a good mood because uh, we have this opportunity and uh, not a lot of people do. So it's nice to be grateful. All in all, not even close to the worst medical experience I've ever had. It was actually pretty easy to get this done. So obviously I didn't film much on the inside, mainly because there were a lot of people in there and my nurse who was super sweet uh, wanted to talk and I feel like that was a little bit more fun than just showing you the IV going into my arm. So uh, that's what I did instead. So this monoclonal antibody based on the study that I just talked about is not kind of like the be all end all. It doesn't mean I'm automatically better. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna stop spreading it if I spread it, if I sneeze on something, if I cough on something. What it does mean is I have a lower chance of getting hospitalized. It means I have a lower chance of dying. Lower chance doesn't mean zero chance. There's always a chance. You know, there's nothing that's 100% in medicine. I hate getting my blood drawn when I have to go for my diabetes exams. I will say uh, the IV was more comfortable than I thought, but still remarkably uncomfortable. My arm was straight for about an hour and a half. It was a 25 minute infusion. It was an hour just to watch to make sure I didn't go into anaphylaxis. Initial reaction, good, I feel fine. No reaction for me. So yeah, I'm gonna go back home because that's the only other place I can go. Uh, well, that was fun. I have to get my blood drawn every four to six months for diabetes. I don't, I don't like it. So how was it? Well, it was a 25 minute infusion followed by one hour of kind of waiting just to make sure I didn't have any reactions to the drug. From what I read, reactions are remarkably rare. One of the things I was worried about is what's actually in the bag other than just the medication. Probably dextrose, but I don't know. Um, I was ready with my insulin pump. Nothing went too crazy, although my blood sugar has been crazy since I've had this thing. I don't know, my sugars have been tough to control, so I don't know what was in there. I was worried that it was gonna burn. I know potassium burns like a lot, but I'm grateful it didn't really hurt other than just getting the needle stuck in there. I got bored after a while because I had a pulse ox on one finger. My left arm was straight, not moving, so to get on my phone was tough, but you know, it wasn't that bad of an experience. Uh, I'll be honest, I think if this gives me even a slight chance to do better than I otherwise would have, I will take it. It doesn't mean that I'm automatically better because I have these antibodies going through my body. It just means that maybe I'll be able to clear it easier. And uh, what's more is it blocks virus from getting into my cells. So there's probably still virus replicating in me. I'm still relatively early in the disease process, especially because I feel a lot better today than I have in the last couple of days. Maybe my body just kind of took it off and I didn't need this, but if there was always a chance that I was gonna be better with it, let's take that chance. 
I am very interested to see the larger studies come out with this particular drug. I'm very interested to see how patients with very severe COVID do with this drug. I anticipate they won't do as well as people with less severe COVID will do because those with very severe COVID, it's kind of already too late for this drug to actually do anything. The virus is already throughout the tissues, in the lungs. This is me guessing based on what I know about medicine. I don't know this for sure, so don't quote me on that. But I think it may be too late for those patients. But for those of us who have mild to moderate COVID, it may kind of take everything a step back and make it easier for our bodies to get rid of what virus we have and so we can go back to being normal. One thing I was reminded of when I was there is that I can't get the booster shot for another 90 days. Now whether or not the booster shot will be necessary for somebody like me who's had the virus and been vaccinated, so vaccinated first, virus second, I'm not really sure. I don't know that there are a lot of us to be honest with you, so we'll see how the studies pan out. But at least three months from now, I can't get the booster shot. I'll probably end up getting the booster shot. Um, I didn't have a reaction really to the first two shots. The third one, you know, who knows, but, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of a low reward, but it's a way lower risk than it is low reward way lower risk. So it's something that I'll probably be involved with. Now all that's left is to have these antibodies do their thing and uh, hopefully I do okay. They did say that for the first 24 to 48 hours I should look for symptoms that uh, my body doesn't like the drug. So yeah, pins and needles for that I guess. Hope you enjoyed day three. Tomorrow is day four of more COVID terribleness.